Hey everybody, so on Friday, the New York Times published an article detailing the ways in which Bernie Sanders in the 1980s, when he was mayor of Vermont, tried to use his office as a platform to influence U.S. foreign policy, which is obviously somewhat novel for a mayor to do, especially a mayor of a relatively small city. The mayor of New York City always uses his platform to have some effect on U.S. foreign policy, especially as it relates to Israel, um, because, you know, in, there's a large Jewish population in New York, and that's just commonplace. Bill de Blasio does it. Mike Bloomberg did it. But for the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, to do it, it was a little bit unusual. And some of the information in the article is actually genuinely interesting, especially if you're not familiar with that history. I actually was familiar with much of it because in 2015, I spent some time in the archive at the University of Vermont in Burlington, which houses the papers and records from Bernie's mayoral tenure. And there's a lot of really fascinating stuff in there, even dating back to his pre-mayoral days when he was basically on the fringes of politics in the state. He ran as a third party candidate for different offices. The Liberty Union Party uh, was a, a very interesting platform. Um, and I, I wrote about it at the time, you know, during the previous electoral cycle. I might at some point actually go back and look through some of those documents that I found and, and write something new. Um, but, but the New York Times just discovered this somehow. And so they did this article where, you know, although, again, some interesting information was presented, it was obviously framed in such a way as to depict his activities in the 80s as unserious, perhaps even disqualifying, at the very least, a big political liability. So, for example... In uh, 1985, Bernie traveled to Managua in Nicaragua and met with Daniel Ortega, who is you know now the leader of Nicaragua. And basically, Bernie made it very clear that he was opposed to the foreign policy under Ronald Reagan, which you know the CIA was deployed to basically oust the government. And Bernie, you know, said, he, you know, he could be, arguably Bernie expressed sympathy with the Nicaraguan government and he lamented that the American media had, quote, not reflected fairly the goals and accomplishments of your administration and that they, the media wasn't reporting the truth about Ortega. And my favorite line from the article is when Sanders seethed at one of the journalists that accompanied him on this trip. His name was George Creel from CBS. And Sanders said to Creel, quote, you are worms. <laughs> and Bernie's always had some of a cantankerous relationship with the media. He doesn't like a lot of them. He doesn't like a lot of journalists. He thinks that they're often focused on the wrong things or they're just trying to get sound bites, or they're not interested in substance, which, you know, is largely true. So I don't blame him for being cantankerous and having an you know inbred or inborn suspicion of especially elite journalists who often like to depict him as some kind of you know, raging leftist or whatever, which, I mean, he is to some extent, but, you know, he's a social democrat. He wouldn't be outside the mainstream in many countries in the world. Um, but now, you know, the New York Times is basically saying that Bernie's going to have to account for the fact that, you know, he was somehow a huge fan of the Sandinistas in the 80s. And... The New York Times doesn't really bother to mention how disastrous the Reagan foreign policy was in Central America. In fact, arguably, the destabilization that the Reagan foreign policy wrought in that region uh, 
you can trace that to the, uh, the, the instability right now in Central America, which is leading to these refugees and, and, and other migrants fleeing north to the U.S. and coming, trying to get across the border. Obviously, it's been a while, so it's not a tight correlation there necessarily, but, you know, it wasn't like 200 years ago. It was a few decades ago. And these kinds of regime change policies have a long-lasting impact on the societies in which those policies are carried out. So I don't think it's too much of a stretch. But, you know, they go through some of the history where, you know, various residents of Burlington were getting fed up with Bernie devoting a lot of his mayoral energies into dealing with foreign policy, which, again, was fairly unorthodox. They quote one Burlington resident as writing to Bernie Writing, to, in a, uh, writing in a letter to the editor in 1986, quote, he's not even running for governor, he's running for the for foreign minister. Bernie ran for governor of Vermont that year and lost. Um, and I actually think it's laudable that Bernie would have devoted so much of his attention to foreign policy so long as he was able to keep municipal functions going, which by all accounts he was. I mean, he was actually pretty widely regarded for his ability to just have basic services function adequately. So, you know, paving roads, you know, sewage systems, that kind of thing. So he kind of governs in, in Burlington sort of as a pragmatist in that respect. But, you know, he also did stuff that's depicted in the New York Times as very suspicious, such as you know, formalizing a sister city relationship in 1988 between uh, Burlington and Yaroslavl. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which was a city uh, in the Soviet Union and on the Volga River. And he, of course, traveled there with a Soviet delegation just weeks before the gubernatorial election that year, or uh, rather weeks before the uh, house race that he ran for in 1988, which he also didn't win. Um, so Bernie actually, you know, people might not re remember this. Bernie actually lost quite a few races in the early part of his career. Um, when he ran for different offices on the Liberty Union ticket, he got like single digits. Um, so he has some familiarity with, with losing. <laughs> uh, but, but it was perfectly viable for him to want to forge closer ties with the Soviet Union especially in this area, era, which was the era of an opening under Gorbachev. I mean, Republicans were encouraging this at the time. That's why they embraced Gorbachev. So the idea that it's like obviously the marker of ideological extremism for him to take in these kind of anodyne diplomatic steps with regard to the Soviet Union is silly. And in, a, in remarks captured on an audio recording, the New York Times melodramatically relays, um, Bernie is quoted as saying, the cost of services is much, much higher in the United States. He's talking about you know, uh, medical care. And he says, in the Soviet Union, health care is free or virtually free. That's true. Bernie wasn't saying that health care in the Soviet Union is exceptionally good in every in circumstance, but he's correct that it's just not... It wasn't cost. It didn't cost anything, or not, anyway, not nearly as much as it does in the U.S. So that's just a statement of fact. But you know, when he, when he was running for for uh, for ha the House, he made foreign policy actually a big issue. You know, he said he wanted to quote reduce the obscene federal military budget. He uh, said that. There are certain aspects of like the Cuban approach to governance that he thought were laudable, even if it was not perfect. So, I mean, none of this should be surprising for anybody who's remotely familiar with Bernie. But nonetheless, I mean, if you're not acquainted with some of that from the Burlington years, it is kind of interesting to, to read through. You know, one, one thing that they, they, they put out is that, you know, Sanders distributed a pamphlet in 1982 saying your vote can help stop another Vietnam because 
uh, he was calling on the U.S. to stop propping up the dictatorship in El Salvador. And he actually backed a ballot initiative that year, basically just to register Burlington's opposition to U.S. involvement in that country, which... You know, municipalities do do on occasion during the Iraq War. A lot of localities passed resolutions opposing it. But, you know, it doesn't actually have a huge real-world impact. It's just sort of symbolic. But, you know, symbolism matters in a way. So I think it was it was viable for him to do this, considering how overzealous, to say the least, the Reagan administration was in uh, throw, overthrowing governments and installing their little puppet puppet regimes in the in Central America and elsewhere, and on Bernie was on Meet the Press today, and Chuck Todd basically like asked him if he regretted his anti-war activism with regard to Vietnam. It's just like, are you kidding? Why doesn't Chuck Todd ask people who weren't opposed to the Vietnam War why they didn't do anything to oppose it, given how utterly disastrous it was? I mean, I have a book on my shelf. Right now, uh, it's called uh, Kill Anything That Moves by Nick Terse. And you got to read this book. I mean, it's even if you think that you know, you know the history of the Vietnam War, you don't know how, how systematically brutal it was and how targeted it was, it was at actually killing civilians, again, on a system, in a systematic way. It wasn't just the My Lai Massacre. Everybody knows about the My Lai Massacre because it was, it was extremely egregious, but just on a more mundane day-to-day -day level, the amount of civilian death that was inflicted by the U.S. is just staggering. And of course, you know, over 50,000 U.S. troops died. Veterans dealing now, even now with Agent Orange and, and other disabilities. So, I mean, that entire American involvement in Southeast Asia was just utterly disastrous. So for Chuck Todd to be pretending as though it's somehow outside the mainstream to have opposed the Vietnam War, or it's like shameful, that's shameful for Chuck Todd to suggest. I mean, he's kind of not a, a especially adroit person, if that's the line of questioning that he's going with. Um, but anyway, you know, Bernie originally didn't respond uh, to requests for comment with, about, about the New York Times article. But I guess the day after it was published, he did get in touch with Sidney Ember, who's one of the reporters. And he had a very contentious interview. And a lot of people you know, were complaining, oh, Bernie was so rude. How dare he? The, the special snowflake New York Times reporter shouldn't be subject to his, you know, his rudeness. And it's just like, no, she deserved it. Bernie should have been ruder, frankly. I'm actually impressed that he managed to restrain himself. He did, but they get into, they get into, uh, I mean, one of the questions that Sidney Amber asks him, and you can read this interview, I'll post it, is you know, at the top of the story, she says, we talk about the rally you attended in Managua and a wire report at the time that said there were anti-American chants from the crowd. I mean, gee, why would the, there be anti-American chants in the crowd when they're trying to overthrow the government by funding like a death militia? But... Bernie responds, the United States at the time, I don't know how much you know about this, was actively supporting the Contras to overthrow the government. So there's anti-America sentiment. I remember that. I remember that event very clearly. And she follows up with him. You recall hearing those chants? Oh, my God. How horrible. There could have been some mean chants going on. And he says, they were fighting against American. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes. What's your point? Are you shocked to learn that there was anti-American sentiment? And then she follows up saying, do you think if you had heard that directly, meaning the chant, you would have stayed at the rally? And he says, I think, Sydney, with all due respect, you don't under understand a word I'm saying. And he says, you know, stuff like that uh, repeatedly. And, you know, there are people whining that this means that, like, Bernie's just, like Trump or something. And he's, like, demeaning the press. It's just, like sometimes the press deserves to be demeaned because they ask idiotic questions. You're not immune from criticism because you happen to be a reporter at the New York Times. In fact, you deserve extra criticism given the influence of that role. Um, 
So, I mean, this is just totally in keeping with Bernie's persona where he rightly finds it annoying when people ask him dumb questions, just like anybody would. Um, Sidney Ember actually is prone to confabulating controversies about Bernie out of thin air. You may remember that in January she wrote a piece basically alleging that the Bernie Sanders 2016 campaign was like this hotbed of sexist abuse and how could Bernie not have known that people were being abused? And one of the big, you know, the big scandals was that some woman volunteer of Bernie's had lodging arrangements in Illinois, I think it was, that she didn't like. And so, like, put in a request to, got it, to get it changed and got it changed. But that was, like, sexist abuse or something that Bernie was enabling. It was so stupid. It was obviously just designed to, to, to kneecap him before he actually announced his campaign and it didn't work. Anyway, I think it's on, on, on one level it's good that these malignant reporters are trying to badger Bernie on foreign policy in particular because it forces him to adhere to his longstanding principles because consistency is one of his biggest political assets. It's why so many people like him. He just says the same thing over and over again and has for decades, almost to the point of tedium. But nonetheless, he says the same stuff over and over again, and they they like that he's consistent. So by bringing up these old statements and these old actions that he took in the 80s, it kind of places an incentive on Bernie that in order to preserve his consistency, he has to assertively stand by and not apologize for these old statements, notwithstanding how they could be twisted by his enemies. So I think it's actually a positive thing militating on Bernie right now, because if he's trying to ingratiate himself with elements of the Democratic establishment, there's obviously a risk or, you know, he's, he's um, he could be inclined to jettison some of those old principles uh, because, you know, they could be seen as a big political liability. And it, part, it plays into why he ended up more or less towing the uh, he ended up towing more or less the mainstream Democratic line on Trump Russia, which I still think is a big blunder and a blemish for him. Uh, but on this is stuff in, on this issue in particular, you know, the regime change in Central America. He he was right. He was basically entirely right in the '80s, and he's right now. Um, so anyway, I think uh, he, he was right to be uh, ornery with this reporter who, who who deserves it and, and then some and I think you know Bernie actually uh, he comported himself well here um, I have criticisms of Bernie on uh, different issues but I'd like to think that they're in good faith I've always said I have a broad affinity with him I voted for him in 2016 doesn't mean I'm a Bernie you know fanboy I can criticize where necessary Um uh, but you know, this is when he's in top form when he's just at war with horrible people uh, in the media in particular and defending a principle that he subscribed to for decades, which is obviously right. Um, and you know, hopefully maybe there'll be more of this going forward. We shall see. Anyway, I'll, I'll link to some of that in the description box. And have a good night, everybody. I'm not going to be watching Game of Thrones. So I hope if you are, I hope your preferred goblin wins or whatever. Uh, but other than that, talk to you later.